on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is an incredible series, I guess, of paintings is all you could call it, representing various scenes out of the Bible. And one of the scenes, Michelangelo has painted what he perceived as God reaching out and with his finger touching Adam's finger, the idea, I suppose, being that life, the passing of life into the first man. If you were a painter, and if it were okay to paint God, how would you paint him? How would you make him look? Chances are you've actually seen Michelangelo's version and may, you may not have realized what you were seeing when you saw it because it has been widely publicized, printed, and used in different kinds of publications. What would God look like? How would you, because after all, when you start painting a face, you are actually painting character. You pick up certain expressions. You try to get a feeling for what the person is like, and you will convey that. Well, would you have, for example, in the God you painted, a, a strong chin, perhaps a cleft chin? Would you paint him with a beard so actually you wouldn't know what was on his chin? What, how thick or thin would his lips be? We tend to sort of think of thin lips as being less generous than full lips. And of course, God is generous, isn't he, and, and giving. He is compassionate. Would you want to paint his eyes compassionate, or would they be piercing, uh, intent? Would they look like they could look right through you and bore holes into your very being? How would he look? What sort of character would you paint his face as an, with an expression of love or with an expression of compassion or maybe anger or possibly wrath. We are told once in the Bible, behold both the goodness and the severity of God. How would you convey the goodness and the severity of God? Now, you can probably see the problem you would face in trying to paint God. For one thing, the image would be frozen in time. This is the case whether you're painting God or a man or a woman or anything else. You cannot, you know, a face, for example, changes, doesn't it? It can be smiling one moment and frowning the next. You can have an expression of compassion on one day and an expression of anger the next. You can be filled with wrath and the next moment you have forgiven and it's all over and you're relaxed and your face is smiling. You could be wide awake one minute and sound asleep the next. And even when you're asleep, you don't look the same from one moment to the next. You can have a slack jaw with your mouth hanging open. You know, your chin can be on your chest. You can look peaceful. You can look troubled. Your eyes can be moving. You can be dreaming. You can not. Human, the human face, and certainly the God face, must change constantly, for indeed it is a living face. And so consequently, any way that you would try to reflect God at its very best would be a frozen image. And of course, the other problem is that it would inevitably reflect your own mood, your own thinking about God, your own feelings about God, perhaps even your own experiences with God. But even then, only at a moment in time. Now, when you think about it, you can understand the prohib prohibition in the Bible against doing a graven image or any likenesses of God. For any attempt at doing so can only create a falsehood, right? Any attempt to portray God can only end up portraying a false God. For just as a picture of you is not you, and very rarely do any of us when we see ourselves in a photograph like what we see. We generally do not like the picture. Well, the picture is frozen, and your face isn't frozen. Your face moves. Your face changes. Even the most stoic of us change from time to time. And so consequently, our pictures never look right. Even when you are dead, all of your friends are going to come by and they're going to evaluate whether or not you really look like yourself. And whether or not a person concludes you look like yourself or not 
will depend in many ways upon whether or not that particular frozen moment that the person in the Undertaker's studio has put on your face is close to, different from, or whether it matches this person's experience of you and whether they have seen you in repose and that's the way you looked when you were in repose. Any attempt to present a frozen image of God or man is certainly going to be false. And every likeness of God is a lie. It is false. Now you can see this readily enough when I present it to you in the concept of a painting on the ceiling of a chapel or in a, in a, a sculpture that perhaps you've made in clay and fired in a kiln somewhere to try to represent the face of God. Maybe you do not, however, see it quite so readily in the images of the mind or in those created by words. For when you describe God, me, for example, trying to say how he looks or say how he is, any effort on my part to try to portray God to you is limited by my own imagination, by the images in my mind, by what I am tempting to project, how I might feel about God, and even if I had seen him with my eyes, I would not be able to convey him to you, and any attempt on my part to do so would be a lie. It is just as easy to paint a false God with words as it is with acrylic and canvas. In fact, it may even be easier to do because anyone can talk and not everyone can paint. And in fact, what you might never do on canvas, you might well do in your heart. This might shed a little light on Ezekiel, the 14th chapter. There's an interesting statement here and one that I think uh, we might have difficulty in grasping at first, at first blush. We're told certain of the elders came to Ezekiel, and speaking in the first person, they came to me and they sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and they have put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that sets up his idols in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that comes according to the multitude of his idols. You have got the risk when you create in your own mind and out of your own imagination an image of God that God might well indeed respond to you in the terms of your frozen image. And that can be a serious matter indeed. He says that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols, the images, the ideas, the thoughts, the theologies. We look at the world, we consider our own experiences, and we imagine a God that rules benignly over all of this, and then we project this image upon the heavens. You do it, I do it, everyone does it. But you have to think for a moment, when things go really rotten in your life, when everything begins to come apart, when staggeringly bad things start happening to you and people you love, what happens then to the image that you have manufactured in your heart and you try to project upon the heavens? You see, it is very easy because of the source of your God and of your image of your God or the idol you set in your heart for your God to become a monster. Now I want you today to consider some thoughts. The thoughts will be draw, draw, drawn from a lengthy dialogue that's found in the book of Job. The problem with doing this is that Job is, of course, a familiar book. The story of Job, I think, is familiar to all of you. But it is awfully difficult, frankly, in sitting down to read through the book of Job to figure out what the book is all about. It's very hard sometimes to come to grips with what 
is here, why it is here, what is it saying, and what does it mean? And I've heard sermons over the years about the book of Job, but I never seem to come out of it clear. And I don't want you to think that you're going to come out of this sermon today with a clear picture of the book of Job. Because the problem is we approach the, jo the book of Job, if we approach it as a systematic approach to theology, we are going to be disappointed, for it is not that at all. It's not a doctrinal treatise. It is not even rational discourse. Job is also not history. There are many people who love to argue the question about whether Job was a real person or whether the book of Job was a parable and where was the land of us and was Job Cheops or was, Job, was it Joseph and, and who was it and so forth. All of that completely misses the point because it really does not matter whether Job was a man who lived at a time and a place or whether he is a character in a parable created by God to say something to you and to say something to me. In one sense of the word, Job is more powerful as a parable than he is as a person. And it is this drama, if you will, that has the power. And this is the way you need to come to this book, accepting that it's real, Accepting that it's true, because even though Jesus spoke many times in parables, no parable was false. They were all the truth. And Job indeed is the truth. But Job is a poetic drama. It must be read that way. If you approach it any other way, you're going to get bored with it. You'll find yourself becoming confused, and you'll find yourself getting thoroughly lost in all of this endless, repetitious, back-and-forth dialogue and all of the real, really futility that is expressed in this book. It is confusing because the people who were speaking were confused. Does that make sense? Ought to. People who are confused have an awfully hard time expressing anything with clarity. But there is one thing that comes roaring out clear and plain to the book of Job, and that is, Job, that is their feelings. When you're reading a drama, you must always keep in mind who it is that's doing the talking. And when I say who, I don't merely mean that you keep in mind that this is Eliphaz and this is Job and this is Zophar and this is Elihu and this is God. I mean, who is Eliphaz? What is he saying? And what does this saying reveal about him and about his perspective and about what he believes? What is the image of God? that he is projecting upon the sky for all of us to look up and see and say, this is God. Because you see, what you're really seeing is God as Elihu or as Eliphaz projects him. Now, apart from Job himself, who is a fascinating study, there are three major characters, major, or shall we call them theologians in the book of Job, I say they're theologians because all of them have an image of God and all of them attempt to project and to portray this image of God. And I want us to think about it, starting with the fourth chapter of the book of Job. And I'm not going to take you through all the events leading up to it. They are fairly familiar. And the whole confrontation between God and Satan and what happened to Job and the loss of his family has been told so many times. We all know that. Today what I want us to think about is what Eliphaz at a moment in time, had to say about God what is the image that he projected of God. Chapter 4, verse 1. Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Job, if I will attempt to communicate with you about this matter, would it be all right? You know, will it be okay if I, if I say a few things? He sort of sidles up to Job in a rather unctuous way and decides he's going to, to speak for a moment. First of all, being careful. He said, Behold, uh, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have upheld him that was, fa was falling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come upon you, and you are fainting. It touches you, and you are troubled. Is not this your fear, your confidence, your hope, and the uprightness of your ways? Remember, I pray you, whoever perished being innocent, 
or where were the righteous cut off? Interesting concept. Who ever perished being innocent? Now you see, in Eliphaz's mind, and I think we might find if we go back and read through some of Job's remarks that he at one time had the same perception that there is a just God in the heavens, that he looks down upon men, that he sees the things that men do and he weighs men in the balance and he rewards or he punishes men according to the things that they do. And we have in Job a righteous man. We have a man who was meticulous in carrying out all the instructions of God, a man who even went so far that he would purify his sons and his daughters in all the days of their feasting. He'd go up and offer sacrifices for each one of them because they might have thought an impure thought. He was careful, careful to the extreme, careful to the nth degree, because he felt that God rewarded righteous men and he punished evil men. Eliphaz says that is the way it is. Who ever perished being innocent. You see, the fact that this thing has come upon you is prima facie evidence that you are not innocent. That's a part of his concept. God doesn't do things like this to innocent people. Where were the righteous ever cut off? Now, in one sense of the word, what he is saying here is if you suffer, you deserve it. This is a part of God's scheme of things. A just God will not inflict undeserved suffering. Now a little bit later, down in verse 12, he will say, Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the visions of night when deep sleep falls upon men. Oh, here we go. Eliphaz is a man who has visions. Now what it was, I, you know, who knows? Did he have too much to eat before he went to bed, and was this a dream? Uh, what was it? I don't know. But he considers it a part of his theology of the image of God, of what he projects upon the sky for all of us to view about God. He said, Thoughts in the vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men, fear came upon me, and trembling which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice say, no doubt with deep, hollow, stentorian tones. Shall mortal man be just before God? Shall a man be more pure before his maker, or rather shall a man be pure before his maker? Behold, he puts no trust in his servants, in his angels he charged with folly. Now, this is heavy stuff. Because we have now brought into this thing a spiritual authority to back up our image of God. And he doesn't say, can a man be, apparently in the original, much more just than God. He says, can a man be just before God? How is it possible that this can be so? He puts no trust in his servants and his angels. He charges with folly. God doesn't trust anybody. And why should he, I ask you, says Eliphaz. Uh, a little bit pompous. And yet not entirely foreign to our own theology, is it? The idea that a man can't really be just before God. You know, we can try, and you can offer sacrifices, and you can live by the law, and you can become an absolute Pharisee. You can even do sacrifices for your children, and you're still not going to be just before God. He doesn't trust those people who live in houses of clay, whose foundation in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Does not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. Oh, this is a real pontificating speech we're getting here from Eliphaz. But it is his theology. In chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Although affliction comes not forth from the dust, trouble does not spring out of the ground, he goes on to talk about other things, but what he is saying here is there is a cause for every effect. Have you heard that before? There is a cause for every effect. Now look at you. 
you're covered with boils. Every one of your children is dead and gone. Your, their houses are destroyed. Your crops are, are burned. All of your animals are run off. And here you, here you sit in the dust. Your own wife is telling you to curse God and die. That's the effect. What, Job, is the cause, he asks. Well, certain logic in that. For every cause, there is an effect, he would say. What is this really all about? He continues on down and says in chapter, chapter 5, verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, don't despise the chastening of the Almighty. Now, there is, once again, there you are. You've got boils all over your body. For every cause, there is an effect. God has chastened you. There must be a reason for God's chastening because God is just, isn't he? Would any of us argue with Eliphaz that God is just and God is righteous? No, we could not. Can we argue that Job is not sitting there with boils all over him? My, we could walk up and touch one of them if we were willing to touch the loathsome things. We can't argue with that. God is just. Therefore, there's something here. He's being chastened. And if you're being chastened, there has to be a reason for what has happened to you. For he makes sore and he binds up. He wounds, his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch you. In famine, he shall redeem you from death. In war, from the power of the sword. Do you realize what he's saying? He's saying that if you do right before God, nothing like this is going to happen to you, so you can't have done right. Because he's going to keep you alive in famine. He's going to keep the sword away from you in war. You'll be hid from the scourge of the tongue. You'll not be afraid of destruction when it comes. And he says that destruction and famine, you will laugh. You will not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Here you are. You are in fear because of what's happened to you. If you were right with God, you wouldn't be afraid. You shall be in league with the stones of the field. The beasts will be at peace with you. Everything in your life will go right if you are right with God. You believe that? You fast sure did. I mean, he stood up and he made his case. I mean, he just eloquently laid it all out for poor Job who's sitting there in pain to have to listen to all this. Job's answer is rather fascinating. I'm not going to take the time really to look at it today because we're concerned now about the images being forecast or projected by these theologians that we read. He says in chapter 15, continuing on down because he speaks again. Job speaks, and then others speak. Once again, Eli, Elihu speaks. In chapter 15, and we'll read this time in verse 14. He said, Behold, or actually, I'm sorry, in verse 14. What is man, verse 14, that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Behold, God puts no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man, who drinks iniquity like water. I will show you, hear me, and that which I have seen I will declare. He goes on and on and on and on. And Job gets so tired. But once again, he is saying, wait a minute, Job. You've been sitting here telling me what Job had said. Look, fellas, I don't deserve this. I haven't done wrong. I haven't done this. I haven't slept with my neighbor's wife. I haven't taken anything away from the poor. I've given the poor of my substance. He can tick it all off. He can lay out the record for them. And not one of them could dispute the record. Not one of them could walk up and say, ah, oh, yes, you did. Three years ago, you did this. They couldn't. Job just kept saying it. And yet, so since we can't come up with something specific, then what I will tell you, Job, is that man is rotten to the core. And you're a man. And because you're a man, you're rotten. And therefore, you deserve what's coming upon you. And Job says, no, I don't deserve this. Job's problem was he believed that God was just he knew he was being punished in a way that he did not deserve, and it threw his image of God completely off the screen. It destroyed it. And he was faced with having to come to grips with a whole new way of looking at God because of what he knew. But his friends, they said, no, no, there's got to be something wrong with you. Later on in chapter 22, he speaks again, this same man, and you can see how consistent he is in his approach and the way he tries to reach out to Job. 
He says in chapter 22, verse 3, Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? I mean, here you are, you're claiming you're righteous. You do good. You have never made a mistake. Is it any pleasure to God that you do righteous? Is it gain to Him that you make your way perfect? Will He reprove you because He's afraid of you? Is He going to enter in with you into judgment? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquities infinite? You have done something. You must have taken a pledge from your brother for nothing. You must have stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given water to the weary to drink. You've withheld bread from the hungry. You, Job, he says, have sent away widows empty. You're a sinner. Own up to it. There has to be a cause for this effect, Job. It's just not possible. God is not unfair. And for God to hit you with this when you don't deserve it is unfair. This is his argument. And he stays heavily, weightily consistent to his argument. There was another theologian there, and his name was Bildad. We first hear from him in chapter 8 and verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. How long will you speak these things? Just how long, Job, he wants to know, are you going to go on? How long are the words of your mouth going to blow like a strong wind? Does God pervert judgment? Because that's what you're suggesting. You are suggesting that God Almighty has perverted judgment. He says, does the Almighty do this? If your children have sinned against him and he has cast them away for their transgressions, you ought to pray about it. You see, if you just prayed more, this would not have come upon you this way. Prayer is the solution to your problem. And Job, of course, sat there with his eyes rolled back in his head and said, he doesn't have any idea how many hours I have spent in prayer for my children, does he? He doesn't even know. But he believed it. He said, oh, now you've got to pray. If you would seek God betimes, if you would just pray about this and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, he would awake for you. He would make the habitation of your righteousness prosperous. Though your beginning was small, your latter end should greatly increase. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age. Prepare yourself to the search of the Father. Let's take a look at history, he says. And in verse 20, he says, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man and he won't help evildoers. They had a very simple, clean concept of cause and effect. If you're righteous, God will bless you, and if you're evil, God will curse you, and we can tell by what's going on here, you must be evil. Now, of course, they did not allow as how all the men who were doing well that they knew were, by that definition, righteous. Actually, you would have to then decide that the rich are righteous and the poor are evil. Based upon this, this, if you take this theology right on out to its limits, wouldn't you? Yet in a way it has a perverse uh, uh, truth to it, in a sense. God does bless the people who are obedient to him, doesn't he? And doesn't he curse the wicked? Oh, yeah. And there's something satisfying about this theology that people who do good are blessed and they get wealthy and God goes on with them and, and the wicked are just punished and bad things happen to the wicked. But the net result of that theology is that the rich of the world must be the righteous and the poor must be the wicked. If you follow it on out. Because you see, it's a frozen image. It's not alive. It doesn't allow for many other things that a person needs to think about. God will not cast away a perfect man. Later, Bildad will say in chapter 24, 5, 4, 4, and 6, man is a worm. He came right on around the same conclusion, see, because after he makes his speech, Job answers him. And he says, no, you're wrong. You know, I haven't done this, and I haven't done that. I have lived a righteous life. I am clean. I'm telling you, I don't deserve it. He says, well, he said, Maybe we can't get down to specifics, but you see, man is a worm. We're all slimy, ugly things in God's sight. And that's why this evil has come upon you. And Job, I don't think, was any more satisfied with Zophar than he had been with Eliphaz. Where did it go? What else was there? Well, 
they all began to argue that, you know, there has to be a cause for every effect. There must be something in this that you just don't see. Zophar, chapter 11 and verse 1, had his version of all these things that went on. Chapter 11, verse 1. Then answered Zophar, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should your lies make men hold their peace? Aha, you've got to be lying. Logic demands it. For once again, you are suffering. This is a truth we cannot ignore. When you mock, is nobody going to make you ashamed? For you have said, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in his eyes. But oh, that God would speak. Oh, that God would open his lips against you, and that he would show you the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know, therefore, that God exacts of you less than your iniquity deserves. Now, he is going to argue not only that Job deserves what has happened to him, he deserves worse. God exacts of you less than all these nasty things you have done. Later, in chapter 20, he will argue that the wicked always get it in the end. It may take a little while, but sooner or later, it all catches up with them in the end. Now, what all these men projected were frozen images. There was, perversely, an element of truth in everything they had to say. You know, we can, we can kind of go back over it. We can say God exacts less than you deserve. And I, I would have to say that of myself, that I have not been treated according to my sins. I've been given mercy and compassion, and I, I haven't been killed by God, and that's what my sins deserve. We can all make that argument. We can all agree that the wicked all get it in the end. We can know that trouble doesn't come without a cause. We can argue along with you if you are in trouble, God may be chastening you. And, of course, that is a very real possibility because God does chasten men. And when we are chastened, we get into trouble. It's always for our own good. As one of them argued, see how good it can be. Hang on there. We all can identify with the idea that man is rotten to the core because when we came up toward baptism and really saw ourselves for what we are, we felt that way about ourselves. We can go through it to know that we are sinners. We know that God does not pervert justice. We can actually follow through all the equations that they did, and in a way, they all seem right. You know, Job also, though, had a frozen image of God. At first, he was confused when all this came down. For no one, no one worked harder than Job to please God. I will say that without any fear of equivocation. He was a righteous man. He was a clean living man. He went way above and beyond the call of duty in the sense of making propitiation to God for sins that might have been committed. And you see, he assumed in that that it was important to God for him to take care of and to cover all those sins that even might have been committed. His image of God was that God was a bean counter. You know, that he noticed every infraction, that every minor little thing that happened was wrong, that he had to account for everything, that the books all had to be balanced, that any little fraction that it was out, and he was in deep trouble with God. This is what he had assumed. Now he comes up to the place when he even got all the beans in the right place, and his whole world, came apart. Anyway, his image was frozen. It also was wrong. You see, the funny thing about, about Job, and you'll find it back in this first chapter, and it is, it is something which uh, is a little hard for us to get our mind around. Begin reading in verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered and said, well, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and avoids evil. Now, I, I don't know what you think about that. But I've got to take God at his word that this was 
the most righteous man on the face of the earth because God said there was none like him. He also says of Job that he is a perfect man. Now, in all of our experience, we don't know any of those, do we? And we certainly are convinced that we ourselves are not one of them. And so consequently, there is a, a feeling of unreality as we read through this segment here. And it is why many people believe that Job is a parable. Because it is ideal. But you see, the point is that what God wants us to understand about this, that for the sake of all the discussion to follow, as far as he is concerned, Job is perfect in all the things that God would ever require of a man. This is part of the play, this drama that's being played out. And as I said, you must read it as a drama, because you, and you must read it as poetry. You must realize that as this is being played back and forth, there are characters speaking, there are emotions flowing and ebbing through this whole thing. And it's very powerful, and sometimes downright funny in the way Job especially responds to some of the people in the way they talk to him when he says, you know, you really are the people, aren't you? And wisdom will die with you. You know, you've got so much of it. When you're gone, there just isn't going to be any more on the face of the earth. He's just so sarcastic in his response to these men because he knows. And there isn't any reason in lying to himself. See, this is another problem that he has. He even tries it as he goes through one of his speeches. He even tries lying about the whole thing. He says, well, let the, you know, if I say I'm righteous, well, I'm going to be found guilty, so let me be guilty. But he knows better. And there isn't any point in going before God and saying, oh, Lord, I'm a dirty, awful, rotten sinner when you know you're not. Is there? All it is is posturing once again. And it's saying, I think God will be pleased if he hears me say this, so I'll say it. It doesn't make any difference whether it's true or not. What does that make God out to be? This is certainly a false image of God, to say the very least. Job is a perfect and an upright man. Well, even Satan had to take that. The great accuser of the brethren, who could follow Job up one hill and down the next, who could sit in his bedroom at night and watch his every move. Satan, who could be wherever he wished to be, who could follow him, could, could see him, could tempt him, could get in his way. God says, have you seen Job? He's perfect and he's upright. And all Satan can say, well, he doesn't do it for nothing. You've hedged him in on every side. You put you know, barriers around his house. You don't let a bad thing happen to you. It pays to serve you. Why shouldn't he serve you? And God said, well, he said, why don't we try it out? All he has is in your power just don't put your hand on his person. You know the story. Satan went out and destroyed everything he had, including his children. They came back. And Job's response was, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God once again says, you know, it's, he just flings down the challenge. Have you seen it? You did all these things and I let you do them. And he's still faithful to me. Oh, well. Skin for skin, all a man has, he'll give for his life. You let me touch his body and we'll see what happens. He says, all right, he is completely within your power. There's only one requirement. You have to spare his life. And he did so. And Job still refused to turn against God. He was confused. He was hurt. He was blind almost with anger in his confusion. Because every, so many things that he had thought, so many things he had believed about God, the image that he had imagined and had he projected about the fairness of God, all of a sudden wouldn't work. And yet he couldn't bring himself to believe any way that God was unfair. But through it all, and when all was said and done, he still knew that he didn't deserve it. Turn back, if you would, to chapter 27. It's this one statement of his that is so powerful. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God lives, who has taken away my judgment. And the Lord, and you know, it's interesting. God, who has taken away my judgment. What I had imagined, what I had judged, what I had constructed and put together, and all my concepts about God have been jerked away from me. 
the Almighty who has vexed my life. And while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. There is no way that I can agree with what you have said. But till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast. I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. I am not going to lie to myself about the life I have lived. Now to our ears that sounds absolutely arrogant. But when you know what God said about him, it is honest. He has trouble with it all. He is still struggling. But he's still holding on to his righteousness. And he was right. He did not deserve it. That is not why it happened at all. What happened to Job did not happen because he deserved it. It did not happen even because he was self-righteous. The book of Job does not tell you that. It tells you the reason why it happened in what I read to you a few moments before. God Almighty said to Satan, Have you seen my servant Job, that there is none like him in the whole earth, a perfect man, upright, that fears God and hates evil? And Satan challenged, and God allowed it. That is why it happened. That's the only reason it happened. Job's affliction was purely and solely to glorify God. That's all. It was not because he deserved it. Now I want you to think about this. All these men were saying, there has got to be something wrong with you. This wouldn't have happened to you unless you deserved it because God is just and God is fair. But you see, if what had happened to Job had happened, quote, because he deserved it, their image of a just God would have required punishment upon them. And they were standing there whole, unharmed, clean, no boils, having lost no property, having lost no animals, having lost no children. But if it happened because of what we deserve, if it happened because you're a dirty, rotten worm, if it happened because man is a slimy creature, if it happened because man is no good, then why am I here? For you see, if it happened to him because he deserved it and God is fair, it must happen to him because he deserves it, right? Therefore, if God is fair, it did not happen to Job because he deserved it. And it didn't. It happened to be actually to glorify God. Now, this is not a strange concept, actually. It's not even an Old Testament concept. It is very New Testament. I want you to turn back with me to John, the ninth chapter. You may even be a little ahead of me if you recall the incident. John, the ninth chapter, in verse 1. Jesus passed by. He saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered and said, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He was born blind so he could be healed. Do you believe that? It's the words of Jesus. Or do you still try to think, Well, you know, sin was in the world and, and it still might have been a parasite or it might have been this or that or some other thing that happened and it just, if it wasn't his fault or his parents' fault, it was somebody's fault in the previous generation or a generation before or a generation before that. You see, your theology kind of requires that that would be the case because the idea that God Almighty in heaven would have a child born blind so that Jesus could glorify God by healing him is just foreign to the way we tend to think about God. What does that say? It says the way we think about God needs to change. There isn't any point in Him changing to meet our image of Him, for I do not want to live in a world governed by my projection of what God is like, and I don't think you do either. God is right in these things. You know what all this boils down to? 
it boils down to some very important truths. If you are suffering, and some of you are, some of you have different problems of different kinds and different levels, I know that. There are people who are here and people who are away who suffer. If you are suffering, it may be to glorify God. It may well be in a matter of glorifying God by overcoming adversity. It may be in glorifying God by enduring uh, adversity and showing the courage that God in you has provided. It may be to glorify God by being in the right place at the right time to be healed and show his power, his power over sin. It may be that you are suffering because of time and chance, because God, after all, makes it to rain on the just and on the unjust. It may be because you stepped off the curb at the wrong moment in time and nobody had anything to do with it other than just your choice that you made that you didn't even do foolishly. You just didn't see. You didn't know. You didn't look. You didn't think. It's an accident. You may be suffering from nothing more than pure accident. You could be suffering because conceivably and rarely there might be going on a rematch between God and the devil. And he said, have you seen my servant? how he is enduring through this whole thing and stayed faithful to me and steadfast in his loyalty toward me and has refused to blame me for what has happened to him? It may be for that. But I'll tell you what it's not, if you're suffering, what it's not. It is not because you deserve it. And you can take that home with you. You can write that down in your book of remembrances. You can know that as surely as you know that you're alive. If you are suffering, it is not because you deserve it. There are just too many people around this world who deserve just as bad or worse who are doing just fine, thank you. And they are a witness that that's not why you then are suffering. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 makes a very, very powerful statement on this. It says, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God lest any man should boast. Grace. Now, you may not have under realized this before, but the book of Job, oddly enough, is about grace. It's kind of about the other side of grace. You see, you are saved through no, quote, fault, end quote, of your own. It's not your fault that God called you. It's not through your righteousness, your works, or things that you did. It's not through your doings. And so consequently, you have to understand that the particular suffering that you are undergoing is not necessarily your fault either. And in fact, I think we can say categorically, it is not because you deserve it. And when Job came out of the situation, it was not because he deserved it. It was grace. He belonged to God. You see, one of the things that we always have to keep in mind, he is God and we are not. We are always human, and he is always God. And human beings get sick. And human beings have accidents. And human beings are sometimes given missions to glorify God. Human beings are sometimes called by God, saved by God, in order to be spent by God. And that's just the way it is. If you love God, you're going to have to live with that. And you know, there is one thing that you can come through this book of Job with and realize. Job really loved God. If he had not, his whole response, his rage, his frustration, his, 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 his ravings almost wouldn't, would have made no sense. It was because he felt betrayed by the one that he loved that he was so torn up. He loved him in the beginning and he loved him in the end. And it all was said and done. He was content to be used by God for whatever it is that he's called upon to do. It is not, as I said, because you deserve it. Anytime we use our logic, our reasoning, to project our image of God upon the heavens, the best we can do is a frozen image. And consequently, it is a false view of God. But I love the way it ends with Job and God. In chapter 42, verse 1, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. I know that no thought can be withheld from you. Who is he that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me that I just didn't know. 
Hear, I beseech you, and I will speak. I will ask, and you will declare to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. He might have even said, I have imagined what you were like. But now my eye sees you. Wherefore I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes.